Yay! Hi, Strange Loop. <laughs> That's a terrifying roar. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. I've been too terrified and too, uh, too hungover, jet lagged. Well, probably hungover too, whatever, um, to see any of the sessions. So I'm really glad that I'm at the beginning of the second day. So after this, I can actually concentrate and see stuff because I've been hearing about this conference for years. Um, my name is Charity. I come from operations. Um, I believe very strongly that the only good diff is a red diff. <laughs> I will write code when I have to, but I feel like code causes problems, and I don't like problems. Um, I am the co-founder of a company called Honeycomb, um, where we are focused on observability for next generation um, and emerging sort of infrastructure methodologies. I'll talk a little bit about it, but not too much, because I'm an engineer and I get really, really wigged out at the idea of anybody thinking I'm trying to sell them anything. Um, so we're just going to steer way over to the other side of that, that road. Um, the relevant parts of my background are um, I ran engineering at Parse for many years, mobile backend as a service, acquired by Facebook, rest in peace. Definitely not bitter at all. <laughs> Um, I've always hated monitoring, like a lot, like a lot, a lot. Um, but I've always felt like running it is table stakes, like any decent engineering shop worth their salt, runs it in-house, owns it, you know? I, I do really strongly believe in that whole, you know, uh, you, should, you should build the things that are core differentiators for you and your business. And you should give every other problem to every other person who specializes in that other problem, because engineering cycles are the scarcest resource in the world, and you don't have enough of them. Um, but for years and years, I thought that anything related to understanding the software you were building and shipping was a core competency. Like, I would brook no argument. And um, that's only changed in the last three years, really. Um, I wrote a review for Baron Schwartz of Vivid Cortex. Um, it's still up there on the internet. It took me about a week to evaluate his software and write the article. And at the end, I was like, oh, yep, yep, he's doing this better than I ever could. <laughs> And it's cool. <laughs> and since then, I've been very much in the camp of, you know, yeah, like increasingly, the visibility is, is a specialized skill set. Uh, understanding what that hell is even happening in your software is really hard, and it's getting harder. So I loved it when Greg said that monitoring was dead, even though he didn't, <laughs> he didn't mean it the way I took it. Doesn't matter, I was still right. Um, and he said, you know, monitoring systems, they have not changed in decades. Like, fundamentally, like, we're still. There are people in this room still running Nagios. Right? Thank you. Angry fruit salad of doom. It's terrifying. We're still running that shit. Um, so obviously, I'm receptive to that message. Um, I hate monitoring, but I love debugging. Like, I love S-Trace more than life itself. <laughs> uh, I love all these sorts of arcane bugs that you're never supposed to have. <laughs> I love firefighting, but I will deny it if I'm sober. <laughs> um, so, like, we're not a monitoring company, and I don't spend my time thinking about monitoring. And I think that, you know, it kind of took me sur by surprise that, like, the term observability um, became contested. But it, it also kind of makes sense. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, we, we do kind of have to spend some time on terms before we really dive into it. But, like, I feel like the, the meat, like, the, the core of this talk is just that like, complexity is exploding <laughs> in a non-linear, you know, uh, way. But the tools that we have for understanding our systems are very much a product of the LAMP stack era. Uh, assumptions like there will always be a host to gather metrics by. Every single person out there charges by host. It's crazy. Or the idea that all the things in slash proc are the most meaningful things you can use to debug your problem. Like, and, and in so many ways, like, the, the, the level of abstraction where we should be even thinking about these problems has, has moved from systems to code, right? If you're containering, you found that out in a hurry. Our, our tools are fundamentally designed to answer known unknowns. They do a good job of that. In Greg's talk, he defined it as like the act of observing blah, 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 blah. Um, and this is outdated. Observability is a term that's taken from control theory, or so Wikipedia tells me. I don't actually know. Um, but the way I've always heard it, and the way that I think it's relevant for us, is 
how much can you understand about how your software works? By looking at its outputs, by looking at the things that you have, like the little bits that you've planted, whether it's log lines or whether it's events or whether it's pictures. Like, can you craft a story? Can you, you know how all of your dashboards go like this at once? <laughs> okay, that's useful, I guess. Only if you couple it with enough intuition and like, and like behind the scenes knowledge of how, how your system already works. It's not helpful if you're trying to learn how your system already works. <laughs> Uh, sorry, rant. I'm only five minutes in. Gotta dull this back. Um, which is why we drink. Um, I, I think that observability is a superset. Monitoring is opera, it's, it's operability. Like when people say monitoring is not for ops, you know, people have been very indignant about this for years. Actually, it is. Monitoring's for ops. Ops is not a bad word. <laughs> Developers should do ops. But monitoring is fundamentally about checking on your systems, making sure that they're still okay, you know, with the defined, you know, parameters of okayness. This is an operational task. Instrumentation is, you know, how you develop a service, which is also not a bad word because operations engineers develop software. You know, it's like, I find it so childish to go like, ops is everything. No, it's not. No, like, monitoring is for ops. It's biased towards outages, right? It's biased towards failures because that's what we care about usually when we're operating software. And it heavily revolves around known, known unknowns. Once something is known, you can monitor for it. Um, when you see people talking about the, uh, this massive explosion of metrics once they, once they try, start trying to monitor everything, well, that's because <laughs> you can't. You can monitor for your known failures. Um, observability is about monitoring, it's about instrumentation, it's about answering questions about your system when it's, when it's a bad, when it's an outage, when it's a failure, and when it's not, <laughs> right? And when you're just like, like, it encompasses the kinds of things that business people need to know to do their jobs well. Uh, it encompasses debugging, it, it just encompasses like how you answer questions. And if you're wondering how you can tell if, if a system is observable or not, can you ask it the questions that you need without jumping in and running command line tools, which we all know and love, and we're all supposed to be working our way out of using. It's fine, it's totally fine. And the reason that we care about this is because complexity is rising. Now, I really, sometimes people start talking about complexity and I just start grinding my teeth. I'm like, just, did, what do you mean, you know? And, and I, I hate it when they use this word, they just throw it out there to cover over the other words and they aren't being very precise in their thinking, so they wanna just be like, oh, well, it's complexity. It bugs me. <laughs> but it's also a real thing. Now, this laptop here is plenty fucking complex, right? But it's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about complex systems. Um, and a distributed system is technically any two nodes that are talking across the network. Well, it's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about distributed systems. Um, distributed, like the computer science of distributed systems is at heart, um, it's a way of thinking about and reasoning about complexity, right? It's about moving that complexity around to different parts of, the, um, of your architecture where you can deal with it better or perhaps worse. Um, systems complexity is, well, all right, I, I drew you a graph that represents the state of the art in computer science. So now you know it's true. Um, how to measure complexity of systems could totally be a talk in and of itself. I went down a giant rabbit hole yesterday while I was finishing my slides. Uh, it's, there's some really cool stuff out there. There's a, so like software complexity is derived from like size, modularity, coupling, cohesion, number of code paths, number of paths that the data can flow through. Uh, how much control flow exists is called cyclomatic complexity. Um, there's Halstead volume, how much information is in the source. <laughs> so cool. Um, infrastructure complexity comes from ways like of communicating between them, exposure to the external no network, storage types. Oh my God. Remember back when there was the database? <laughs> you had to choose Postgres or MySQL? <laughs> I miss those days. Like, like yes, you should, you should tr you choose boring software. You should choose predictable software when you can. But when you're a startup or when you're building something new, so much of your competitive advantage comes from rolling the dice on the newer, greener technologies, you know? And I find it very condescending when people are just like, well, you should just always use the boring stuff. It's like, no, you don't know my problem set. Parse grew up with MongoDB. Best thing that ever happened to them. Um, 
that's another rabbit hole. Anyway, uh, anyway, so like lamps. I'm only using terms lamp stack and um, you know microservices, even though I know they're not really accurate. But just kind of to group umbrella terms, right? Like the last decade of computing and like the decade that we're embarking on now. There's a big difference in complexity between the lamp stack and parse a couple years ago. You know, and we were a platform. People could upload whatever JavaScript they wanted. They could run whatever database queries we wanted. Uh, cloud code, you know, requests could loop back in multiple times. Uh, and that's why we built Honeycomb. Like, honestly, like if you re rewind the clock, it's like we had built a system that was fundamentally undebuggable by around the time that we got acquired. So the best engineers in the world could not, like, it's not undebuggable, but it would take hours, days, even weeks to track down some of these bugs. So it was not debuggable from the perspective of we have a team of 10 engineers <laughs> who need to get any work done. But as complex and interesting as that was, like, Facebook's better or worse. I started to say worse. Better. Let's go with better. Um, <laughs> it's more like the electrical power grid, right? I feel like if you want to model systems correctly in your head for like the next generation, think about would this work for the electrical grid? Right? Because there are local problems you know nothing about, but you have to treat them anyway. There are systemic problems you will not know about if you're only looking at local problems. It gets really fun. Let's go through some example problems. Lamp stack. These will be very, very familiar to all of you. Someone complains, photos are loading slowly for some people. Why? Well, OK, app capacity is exceeded. Errors or latency are high, database is saturated. Um, you know, like, what all of these have in common is you can pretty quickly tell where they're coming from. Uh, if it's a bug in your code or whatever, you want to attach a debugger and jump in and do a deep dive there, and, like, that's it. Uh, and this is, very, this is a very easy system to monitor. Monitor these things. Done. Um, characteristics of this system. Known unknowns, blah, blah, blah. It's friendly to intuition. You get a page, you don't even need to look at the dashboards half the time, but of course you have them. Many, many, many dashboards. I fucking hate dashboards. And the health of the system more or less accurately represents the experience of the individual users who are using it. Cool. Best practices monitor it a lot. I don't know. Like, it's not, not too hard. Write a run book for things that exceed the ability of, like, auto remediation. So here are, here are some examples that we had at Parser Instagram. Um, any microservices that happen to be running on a C2.4XL and using provision type storage in the US East 1B availability zone has about a 1 in 20 chance of being slow if it had to flush to disk. <laughs> um, and at hotspots for certain users, because of the hashing, like, fan out model, um, just makes certain, you know, segments hit that more often. This is a bitch to track down. Or, like, you know, the Canadian users who are using the French language pack on this version of the iPad, using this version, version of iOS, like, caching doesn't work. Bitch to track down. Or like, you know, this newest SDK gives you a feature flag so that you can run all the database queries sequentially. Not even a bug. Like, what am I supposed to watch for? <laughs> you can't. These aren't problems, they're symptoms. And I, I had many more slides of these, believe me. It was like PTSD, the trauma just keeps coming. Um, but like, any of these users write in, and they're like, you know, Parse is down, and they'd be so angry at me, and I'd just be like, Parse is not down, motherfuckers. Look at my wall full of dashboards, and they're all green. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of them would be green. I get super angry. Um, but, like, I argue with them, and I'm just losing credibility, right? It doesn't make it, the performance any better for them. They can't log in any more than they could before I told them we were up. <laughs> um, and, and this was like the heart, this was the meat of the, prob of the problem when, when we got into Facebook and we put our stuff onto Scuba. And they had like pushed all these different tools on us, and none of them made a difference for us. Um, we, we were still like reacting to symptoms as though they were problems. And, and when we got our stuff into Scuba, like it was life changing for me. Um, 
scuba is, there are white papers out there. In fact, I did a Papers We Love talk um, this summer on it. It's just, a, it is a janky ass, like piece of shit software that like clearly was not designed, it evolved to help them track their own databases, handles white events, and it's amazing. Ask any Facebook engineer and they miss that. Um, it changed my life. I was a better engineer with it. That's why we built Honeycomb. And I, honestly, like my grand plan with, buying, with building Honeycomb was, so I'm leaving Facebook, VCs want to give me millions of dollars, I'm super gonna fail, but I'll take their money, I'll build this thing, when we fail, I'll open source it, and I'll never have to live without it. <laughs> we just keep not failing, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe someday. But like, you become a better engineer when your window for solving these problems goes from hours and days to like seconds or minutes, like repeatedly. And what all these have in, in common is, well, they have a lot of things in common, but there's a lot of unknown unknowns, and there's, there's a lot of um, things that, it, this will happen one in a million times, almost never. Well, except if you're at Facebook, it happens once every few minutes, right? And then you, and then you get into categories of problems that are like, you know, well, this happens one every thousand or 10,000 times, when intersected with this other thing that only happens one out of, out of every hundreds of times. And like those, like tracking down those things that require like four or five rare things to happen, Non-trivial. Um, and these are the problems that you all have look to look forward to. <laughs> you know, like the categories of problems that Google has had and Facebook has had for however long are the problems that more and more and more people are having like sooner and sooner. And part of this is self-inflicted. Like, let me be very clear. Like, some of this is necessary self-inflicted. This is some of it. Containers. <clears throat> um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and some of it's not. Um, and some of it is just thrashing around and trying to figure out how to like, deal with this freight train of complexity that's coming everyone's way, which is how I categorize microservices. We've been doing microservices since, since, since like 2007, Jesus Christ. Anyway, sorry, angry old man. The characteristics of these systems, unknown unknowns are most of the problems. Like, the system health is table stakes. Like, that's, like, you never even look at it because it's just, it works, right? Um, but you have this long, infinitely long, thin tail of things that almost never happen, except that once that they do. Uh, and usually you don't get good bug reports. You get symptoms <laughs> that are described to you by users, and about 40% of the time it's because they didn't turn on their Wi-Fi. <laughs> Which is extremely demoralizing to the engineers that you're asking to go track down this problem. The hardest problem is often just figuring out which component <laughs> it lives in so that you can trace it or debug it or whatever because again, everything's going like this at once on your graphs, right? And it's, it's really about the health of the system is no longer as important. Honestly, if your system was 75% down and all of your users were having a good experience, would you care? I wouldn't. Uh, I would care if it was 99.9% .9 up and I was getting a lot of complaints. Right? So I don't really feel like up or down or like is, is all that meaningful when it comes to system health. What is important is being able to find and identify every single request and slice and dice by every single characteristic that they might share. Um, and the reason that I think it's important to distinguish monitoring from observability is there are some very good time-tested best practices for doing monitoring that do not apply to observability. And, and I don't want to, to like, to lose them, right? Like, like the monitoring principle that, is, that says that you should not have to go look at your graphs every day to know if something's wrong. It should tell you. Super agree with that. Do I want to get paged about 20 fucking thousand things that I'm like trying to, that I'm feeding into my observability system? No, I don't. I don't want to get, I don't want to get paged about almost anything that our users are going to complain about or else all of my engineers will quit and I will too. Um, and, and the rest of the talk, we're just going to get into each of these and like describe them a little bit more deeply. Um, instrumentation, I'm not even going to bother with this because I assume you're already sold in this one. Um, I will just point out that basically what we all want is distributed S trace, right? We all want distributed GDB. We all want to be able to hop around from node to node. Um, all these, you know, we've separated out our monoliths and microservices. And this means that no component can actually debug the whole story for us. And the holy grail that we're all tracing is something that can. 
Uh, distributed tracing is, is cool for this. Like they take a very depth first approach. Honeycomb takes a breadth, breadth first, you know. Uh, once you know what to trace, um, all the distributed tracing stuff is amazing. Honeycomb is much more about what do I even trace? Like seriously, what? Events, not metrics. This is super controversial, but um, I don't care. Um, there are a couple of reasons that this is true. Uh, cardinality is one. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten high cardinality data sets to work well with metrics. No. And a lot of us have kind of deluded ourselves into thinking that this is okay, that we don't really need it, we don't really care about it. We're just fine, we're better off, really. I feel like there are entire generations of engineers who have, have internalized limitations of metrics as being limitations of data. It, it, it is not. It is a problem with the metric itself. Um, metrics can't be traced. Um, they don't have context like events do. So, like, you all know what a metric looks like. Oh, this is a slide I didn't really get finished. Well, anyway, so a metric is a dot of data, right? It's, an, it's a number. And in order to, then you get all these numbers, and it's like, well, how do I find my numbers? Well, you, add, you append tags, and you can have some fixed number of tags. Um, hundreds? I don't know what Datadog does now. Um, the issue with this is um, it is fixed. The right amplification is huge. Uh, you don't want to append a lot of text. Uh, think of your bill ID, infinitely uh, incrementing uh, integer. Well, if you, want to, if you want the bill ID to be a tag, which is possibly the most important and meaningful tag that you could have, then you have to set up all this complicated pruning, whatever. Um, so a metric has all these tags. Um, an event is just, it's a log line without the necessarily flushing to disk, right? An event is a structured sentence of data, as many key value pairs or as much, much data structures as you want. And I understand why we got started with metrics, is because hardware was obscenely expensive, right? Like Google back in the year 2000, like, well, I got this really big website. <laughs> what am I get? How can I tell what it's doing? Well, you know, logs, I'm killing my system with logs. Let's have metrics. There's literally no less data that we could possibly have than a metric. That sounds cool. Like, Hardware is not that expensive anymore. And also, you can sample. You can sample. Sampling is amazing. And there are some people who ha seem to have this weird allergy to sampling, which I understand if you're building a billing system. I do not recommend that you sample your billing system. But for any of your operational data, it's not only a, it's not only a should do, it's a must do. It's just a question of when. A, you don't want your engineers acting like it's not sampled, because then they're going to make bad decisions. Uh, B, you really want every request that enters your system to generate many events, lots and lots, like every service that it goes through, every database that it goes through, like shit, like a parse, like I think we calculated the average API request generated about 50 events. Um, at Facebook, it was hundreds, you know? Like, you're not going to build a, an observability or analytics system that is hundreds of times that of your actual system, therefore sampling. And you can do it dynamically so that you're not attaching equal weight to every single, every type of data, right? Like every 200 status, HTTP status code that came into our system, I think we kept 20%, Instagram kept 0.1%. Um, every 5OX, well, we kept all of them, right? And we let the uh, rate limiter like slice up the top of the mountain. Uh, the read queries, we kept some sample of them and delete, we kept all of them because people very rarely deleted their apps and we wanted to know when it happened. Sampling is awesome. Um, cardinality. Literally all of the fields that I most want to know information about, all of them tend to have very high cardinality. If you have 10 million users, like this is how Scuba changed our life, like on, the, on day one. It was the ability to break down first by that application ID and then by every combination of everything else. Boom, like that's it. Like suddenly we went from, like just trawling between like logs and metrics and dashboards and all this shit and going back and forth to just going, oh, I see. Yeah, okay, you say parses down. I see that every time you're hitting the login endpoint, it's taking 61 seconds because it's doing a 5X full table scan and it looks like you deployed that query there. Life changing, it was amazing. Uh, and, and even the ones who like tur didn't turn on their, their Wi-Fi, you can just be like, you're not hitting our edge, sir. You know, because you can break down by, by that. Like, shopping cart ID, uh, raw queries, names. It's, uh, uh, cardinality, man, it's, it will save you. <laughs> 
Uh, we, we did have to write our own storage engine to do this, though. Nothing else out there could do it. Believe me, I've, tr I've spent my entire career telling people not to write databases. And I stand by the fact that I haven't. It's a storage engine. <laughs> High cardinality is not nice to have. It is, it is a must have, and especially for platforms. Platforms are kind of the bellwether. Um, and, and I define platform as, as something where you're letting users define a great deal of the behavior, right? It's not just the queries that your software engineers over there wrote. It's queries that God knows who over on the other side of the planet wrote, and you can't throw things at them, like ever, by definition. It's a platform. <laughs> um, in the future, most of us are platforms, and part of this is just because it's what the market is demanding, is that ri richer feature set with more user-defined controls. And with user-defined controls comes great chaos. <laughs> and these tiny, these tiny, like, humans just, yeah, humans inject chaos. You know that. I'm not even going to bother with that one. And structured data. Like, structure your fucking data. It's 2017. It's almost 2018. Why does anyone have any unstructured logs? String processing is not getting any faster. Um, another, another f thing about this is, is that, no, never mind, I think that's in a later slide. We'll skip it. Uh, events tell stories. Like, like, so, so, like, metrics are never going away, and I don't, I love metrics, I do. I, I just, I make big statements because it's what I do. Um, but like, Facebook still has a very large metrics uh, system, ODS. Um, Amazon does it, they managed to combine them into something that's even better, I think, but, anyway. Um, Metrics are great, but they don't really tell stories, and they don't come with the rich context. You know, any event that you that you um, submit has all of the the details about the request, and then it has all the context you can pack in there about who it was for and when and what was the state of the system at the same time. They're much more explanatory. They're much more powerful. This is how our brains work. Our brains tell stories. Um, Structure your data, yes, all over the source to read. Well, efficiencies, that's boring, whatever. Um, what about my dashboards? Well, what about your dashboards? <laughs> Every place that I've ever worked has gotten dashboards to find your dashboards with your dashboards. <sighs> Dashboard rot, it's awful. Um, the, th the reason I hate dashboards somewhat facetiously is Every dashboard is basically an artifact of a past failure, right? You're doing a postmortem, and you're like, I'm going to construct a dashboard, so we'll find this problem immediately the next time. OK, um, cool. Uh, so the next time something happens, you just start jumping to answers. You're just like, answer, is it this one? Oh, is it that one? Is it that one? Like every single one of them, perfect representation of a particular failure. You're not actually doing computer science. You're not really even debugging. You're not asking questions or falsifying hypotheses about how the world works. You're not going, hmm, what about this? And then what about this? What about this? No, you're just like, ah, I got it. <laughs> oh, no, not that one. Ah, I got it. Like, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that feeling of your eyes just like darting around like this. Well, maybe it's this. Well, maybe it's that. Oh, I can't get this in the same dashboard until, unless I write some. Like, it's like eyeball exercises, but it's, what it's not is debugging. And you get like this dashboard blindness when you've been looking at them for a while, where if you did not remember to graph a thing, you could be jumping around on dashboards for two hours before you remember, oh, wait, did, did we never set graphs up for that? Or, huh, maybe, maybe that thing stopped collecting data. You know, let's go look at it. In, in the way that you build up a richer mental model of your incredibly complex system, when you're asking questions and iterating on them, dashboards are like, they're like, they just short circuit that entire process. I think that engineers, I, I don't think it makes for good engineering. I've seen engineers become better by doing exploratory, iterative interrogations of their systems. Dashboards must die once I am queen. Also, you really want raw requests. You know, you're, you're, looking, you're looking for that needle in a haystack. You're looking to find every single needle in that haystack. Every single needle should be findable. Every single API request should be locatable. You should be able to tell if a report is accurate or not. Um, aggregation, once you have, like, once you have 
the time series aggregates, like we all know how they work, right? You have an interval, maybe a second or whatever. Everything that happens in that interval just gets smushed. You just throw it away. And you can never unthrow away that detail in that context. Um, you can never go back. You can never ask the same arbitrary open-ended questions that you could with the raw data. Um, you, need, you need more detail, you need more context, not less. Um, and, and by this I mean write time aggregation, of course. Um, read time aggregation is terrific. You can get the same benefits without the cost, but nobody seems to be doing that other than us. This is part of what I'm talking about, is I want all of you who are going to go home and build tools, please build more of these things. Like, this is not a sales pitch, this is a cry for help. Um, black swans are the norm, and you can't hunt your needles if you can't find the outliers. I'm not just talking percentiles, I'm talking actual max and min. Here are examples of really powerful, awesome things that you can do if you're just collecting and sampling like those raw requests. For example, I think that the only re reason that DBAs exist is because the tooling is so shitty. It's just a complicated piece of software. Like, everybody knows how to do one thing. Look for slow queries in the slow query log. But then they go, oh shit, well this query hasn't changed in two years. Uh, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and the reason why is because what they're looking at is, you know, the reads, because the reads can yield. Writes can't yield. Never gonna show up there. Um, and what you're probably looking for is what's holding the lock? Just please tell me where is the lock time being held by? You know, every, every platform that uses MySQL to store their user data has this problem where, you know, a bot, a bot gets, starts running, like in GitHub, you know, a bot starts doing all these crazy things. Or, you know, an iOS app gets submitted to the iPhone, iTunes store, goes to the top. You know, all these things happen un unpredictably, and your central, central database just starts crunching, you know, just like to the ground, and everybody's suffering. Like, at, at Parse, like, this was the story of our lives, and then we get into shit in a scuba, and we're just like, oh, 97.3% of the write lock time is going to that user. Boink. Throttled. Like, it's transformative. <laughs> Ugh, it makes me feel so excited. Uh, or, or, like, you know, yeah, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Rich events, dude, they're so cool. They're so cool. You can do so much stuff with them. Databases are just, I, I firmly believe that if you have this type of tooling, you can hold your Android and iOS developers accountable for their own fucking queries. Users don't care what the system health is. They just don't. That means I don't care either. It's nice not to care. You need to test in production. This is like the PS that I just kind of snuck in there. Um, like, think about the national, the electrical grid, right? You're not going to bring up a staging copy of that. <laughs> Honestly, most of the time that I, I personally have spent on staging and the time that I've seen other people spend on staging has been completely wasted. Completely wasted. It drifts, gets out of sync, the data isn't the same. Like, you're not, the, the, that long, thin tail of problems that represent most of your actual problems going forward, never gonna turn up there. And even if you do, like, I, I'm the proud author of some capture replay software that will capture everything going into a system for 24 hours and replay it with con concurrency and all this cool shit. Love it. It's limited. <laughs> even if you capture and replay yesterday's traffic, you cannot predict tomorrow's. Like, you can't predict what app is going to get launched. You can't predict any of that stuff. And the place that everyone is under-investing hugely is in tooling for production, in failing fast, in rolling back, in canaries, right? Staged rollouts. Ones where, you know, like, I was tweeting shit up about this a couple weeks ago because Facebook finally released a blog post and like, yay, we can deploy from master now. Woo! Now, that may seem like a big deal to you, may not. It should seem like a big deal to you when you remember how many interns they have. <laughs> if it works for Facebook, yeah. And the way they do it is first they, they deploy to the internal Facebook for everyone, right, at 1% Canary, and then promotes to 5%, 10%, whatever. Um, and then they deploy it to the, you know, the live grid and everything. Um, so good, and, and like, we all have limited engineering time. Um, and people are so scared of breaking production that they're not accepting the fact that we do, like, we do test in production. We can't not, because it doesn't matter how many, and by the way, I'm not saying don't test before production. These are not mutually exclusive. Do that, please. But then also, like, invest that engineering time into, into feature flags, you know, into shipping things safely and making it your education so that every engineer knows how to get to a good state, uh, making it so that multiple versions can live alongside each other, data migrations. 
So this, this kind of leads into my last point, which is that I really believe that like, the future belongs to the generalist software engineers. You know? uh, they're in the driver's seat. Um, I feel like the first wave of DevOps was like, OK, ops people, time to write code. It's like, yeah, OK, we got it. Got it. We're all writing code now. And now it's like the second wave has just begun, which is, all right, software engineers, time to learn to mind your own shit. You know? <laughs> and no one is saying that like, these specializations are, are going away. Ops is always going to be needed. It's just that it increasingly is on the other side of an API. Right? Um, and software engineers, no one is saying you have to like, do all your own backups. Like, just, what we are saying is you can't craft good, scalable, well-designed services without understanding how they work. That's not so controversial now, is it? <laughs> I feel like um, uh, DBAs, ops people, you know, every, every, every role that is not a general software engineer is increasingly in the, it, we're force amplifiers, right? We're amazing at helping you run your own stuff or we work on the other side of APIs. And there's a lot of awesome, like, superhero powerfulness in just being able, understanding how the life cycle of your code after you've hit ship. Um, it's 20, 2017, like, we wouldn't hire a system admin who can't write a line of code. We should not be hiring or promoting software engineers who will not accept responsibility for their services. Now, I get why for so long that it was so awful. It was just like, oh, I don't want to torture myself like the ops people do. <laughs> like, I don't want to torture myself either, but I get that this is somewhat self-inflicted. Like, as a, as, a, um, as a group, we are not known for our work-life balance. Own it, I will. It doesn't have to be awful. It really doesn't have to be awful. Instrumentation is part of building software, and watching it run in production is your fucking job. If you don't watch it when it's normal, you won't know what abnormal looks like. And I, and I think that like, we're trying to build something that makes it easy for you to just like, poke around, look. And more people need to accept this as insanity. It's insanity that so often you hit deploy and you never look at it unless it's wrong. Your code is not shipped until it's in the wild. And your code is not tested until you've watched it running with real data, talking to real services, handling real users, real traffic patterns. So Gregory's last two slides were these. Um, the way to think about observability in a glorious future is think about distributed systems. Um, the research has been focusing on these problems for decades. We can learn things from them, even though I kind of forget that academia exists. It doesn't. Distributed systems failures will help you future-proof your systems. And good news, what you win is, like I said, remember when I said one of the best practices for monitoring was you have all these alerts and stuff? I believe that with these big, complex, far-flung distributed systems, the only tractable way to run them is with like four paging alerts. Like, that's it. Just latency, errors, you know, the big three, and then maybe saturation. Um, if you trust your ability to debug any problem in just a couple of clicks, and if you built resiliency into every level of it, you should almost never get woken up in the middle of the night. And this may seem like a pipe dream in John, Len John Lennon's immortal words, or whatever, but it's not. Like, I've lived through this. I've lived through this repeatedly. It works. It's beautiful. So uh, I just had like a summary of the old way, the uh, new way, uh, the way things are changing, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>